Well, today I'm going to do two things that I've never done before. And one is I'm going to give a sermon that I actually gave back in uh, 2011. And the uh, second thing I'm going to do that I've never did before is I'm going to give a sermon that I gave back in 2011 that I also gave at a seminar at the Faith Walkers Conference. Uh, and actually, this sermon is based on a sermon I heard about 25 years ago that my Uncle Dan taught. And it's amazing that it stuck with me all this time. The name of the sermon is Henry and Jenny, which it comes from the book of Hosea. And Hosea is a hard name, and he, there's this gal in the book, and her name is Gomer. And so you got Hosea and Gomer, so Henry and Jenny is the name of the sermon. Uh, and my uncle gave this message about the love of God, the scandalous, amazing, shocking love of God. And it's, I think it changed me. And it stuck with me for decades. And he wrote a song. He's, he's this cool preacher, and he sings songs and plays on a, on a well, on a few different instruments, but usually a ukulele. And, and that song stuck with me all these years. So you heard it before. The, uh, we've done it here. The worship team's done it here a couple times before. But that song, we're going to have special music again at the end of today's message. And I really hope that it it does for you what it did for me, that you don't just walk out of here and forget this message about God's love, but the song is going to help you remember how good God is. If you have never had a chance to dig in and study the book of Hosea, I believe with everything inside of me that you are in for a real treat today. I think it's one of the greatest books that's often ignored in the scriptures. The prophet Hosea shows us that God loves you more than your dog, and he's more dependable than your pickup truck. This is an ancient text, but the message is also so incredibly relevant. This, these are ancient words, and they're going to hear, they're going to sound like they could have been written by somebody yesterday. So open your Bibles now, please, to the book of Hosea. And it's right after the book of Daniel. Hosea was a prophet in the northern kingdom. Do you guys remember when we studied the Old Testament that uh, there was King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and after that, the nation of Israel had kind of a civil war and is broken up into two halves. The northern part, where most of the tribes were, and that was called Israel, and then the southern part, which was dominated by the tribe of Judah. And so Hosea was a prophet from the northern kingdom of Israel. And here's something interesting. Out of all the prophets that we have who wrote in the Bible, Hosea is the only prophet whose writings from the northern kingdom still remain with us. So I don't know if there was other writing prophets from the north and we just don't have their stuff, or if he was the only prophet from the north who actually wrote down his message, but there you go. So we have Hosea, this prophet from the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, context. Globally, this is about 100 years before Confucius or Siddhartha Gautama Buddha were born. Rome is just a newly founded, not yet a great city, the first Olympic Games are being held in Greece. And significantly for Israel, there's this country called Assyria to the north, and it's becoming a regional power, uh, an empire, the most powerful nation on earth, and it's going to cause a lot of misery for the Jewish people. It's going to cause a lot of misery uh, for the descendants of Abraham. Locally, so this is going to be a time of great disaster. They're living, Hosea's living at a time when his country is falling apart. Okay, I just said that, and I don't know if you connected with that. You're going to work. You want to raise a family, right? You have dreams for your future. You have hopes for your children. And your country is falling apart. And there's uh, the, this threat of Assyria to the north is coming down, and now Hosea's a prophet, and he's going to say, the northern kingdom is going, to be, is going to be wiped out. Israel had six kings in just 25 years, and four of those kings <coughs> were murdered by their successors. 
There's chaos in the land. It's a, chaos is a horrible thing. You don't want to live in interesting times, right? That's the old curse. May you live in interesting times. No, thank you. Want to live in nice, boring times. These were not boring times. These were deadly times, times of, of disaster, of despair. Assyria is casting a shadow over the land. The entire northern kingdom is living in fear. The people are abandoning their faith in God, and they're trading it in for worship of Canaanite fertility gods, pagan deities, the worship of Baal. And in the middle of all of this darkness and gloom comes Hosea. Now, Hosea is a small book here in the Old Testament. And again, it's a book that Christians, for some reason, often skip. It's not an often studied book. But the Jewish Talmud calls Hosea the greatest prophet of his generation. The greatest prophet of his generation. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you next. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. Wow. Isaiah wrote this big book in the Old Testament. We focus on Isaiah, and rightly so, because he foreshadows so much the coming of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Hosea prophesying at that same time, now, is also, you know, Isaiah was a southern kingdom, Judah, Hosea, northern kingdom, but he also talked about the south. He's also going to give us a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Amazing Old Testament books. Uh, I'm not going to preach this next page because it's blank. The prophets Amos and Hosea served in the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, while Isaiah and later Micah served in the southern kingdom of Judah. Hosea is called the prophet of doom. How's that for a moniker? How would you like to be known as the prophet of doom? You don't get invited to a lot of parties. And when you do get invited to a party, you're not just very popular. People kind of just leave you over in the corner. And you, you guys all have the image, right? The guy who's the prophet of doom, he looks scraggly. He's got this big, unkept beard. He's wearing robes. He maybe has a rope around. He's walking on the corner of the street. And on the other side is people, a union maybe protesting. But on his side, this guy's carrying the, the end is near. <laughs> Prepare for the end. And, and he, he was this kind of guy. And his message came true in his lifetime. And it gets worse. Hosea was stranger than the guy on the street corner holding the sign saying the end is near. His life played out like reality TV. It was scandalous. And here's the weird part of his scandalous life. It was God himself who told Hosea to live this way. Here's the real twist in the story. The really odd guy in the book of Hosea stranger even than Hosea, turns out to be God. In fact, God is portrayed in such a counterintuitive way. The book of Hosea says, thing about, says things about God that if the Bible didn't say them, I don't think I could. It almost feels blasphemous. It almost seems strange, some of the things that the Bible's going to teach us. So let's look now, uh, chapter 1, all the way through chapter 2, verse 1. Please follow along with me. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reigns of Jeroboam, son of Johash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman. All right. I heard a laugh out there. If you are not familiar with, with the book of Hosea, you did not see that coming. There is no way you saw that coming. Everybody knows about the Bible, but knows about God. Who thought the word of the Lord came to Hosea and God said, go marry a promiscuous woman? What, what happened to God? Hello? Is this, is this the same fellow we see in the rest of scriptures? What was God thinking? Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. And, and some of yours may say it's children of adultery. Uh, they, they weren't his children. For an adulterous wife 
this land is guilty. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So God is making his life like a reality play. God says the people of the land, because they're chasing after other things, they've made other things more important than me, they've, they've left, turned their back to me, he said it's the land, the country, the people of Israel are just like an adulterous woman who runs away from her husband. And so he tells this prophet, Hosea, you're going to suffer. This is going to hurt. I want you to marry a gal, and she's not going to be faithful to you. And it's going to show people how my relationship with them, what my relationship with them is like. So he married Gomer. Now right away I'm thinking, well, I know there's a Gomer in Genesis, and then there's Gomer Pyle, right? Jim Neighbors from the Andy Griffith Show. I don't know a lot of Gomers. And so I kind of feel bad for this girl. Maybe she grew up so messed up because her parents gave her this name, Gomer. Uh, so he married Gomer, daughter of De Blame, and I am glad that somebody is to blame for this promiscuous girl with the really unfortunate name. And she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said, Hosea, call him Jezreel. And this hurts if you have children. Listen to this. Call him Jezreel because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. Oh. It's like naming your kid 9-11 or something. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Boy, how do you like to be a prophet? And your message is to tell people, God's going to end the United States. God's going to end the United States. Tell the people I'm going to put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. I'm going to break your military. Everything you have confidence in, it's going to be gone. Gomer, now you see why I'm calling her Jenny, right? Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said, Hosea, call her Loruhama, which means not loved. Boy, we've got some precious little girls in this church. Wonderful little sweeties. I remember when my kids were little. They're so beautiful. They're still so beautiful. And uh, I asked my gals, we were living in, in, in Milton at the time, I said, I, I was, had a serious face, but I'm having fun, you know. I said, do you think that all little girls are princesses? And they took the question seriously. And they said, I think so. All, and they were absolutely right. All little girls are princesses, and God says, call her not loved. For I will show love, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, and I will save them, but I'm not going to save them by sword or, or by battle or by bow or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet, yet, things turn. The Israelites are going to be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. See this prophecy? This is why, that, why some of the old timers said this is the greatest uh, prophet in the Old Testament. God's giving this promise that no matter what happens to Israel, and we know how they were scattered among the nations and brought back and scattered again and brought back again. God says no matter what happens, their unbelief has ruined their nation. They're running in disbelief all directions. But despite that, God is going to bless them. And they're going to be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the, prophet, the people of Israel will come together. So this is a prophecy of the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, no longer being separate, but it's one Israel, one people. And they will appoint one leader who will come out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. And some scholars think at this point, Maybe the children had their names changed, again, to show uh, the people uh, God's intent. Hosea 
chapter 6 says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? And Ephraim was the strongest tribe in the north, kind of symbolizes the nation of Israel, the way Judah represents the southern kingdom. God says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? And what can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. You know, I've prayed this prayer. God, what can you do with me? Seems like sometimes my love for you is like the morning mist. Have you ever felt like that? That your love for God is so easy to worry. It's so easy to be filled up with yourself. It's so easy to be bitter and angry and selfish. God, I say I love you, Lord, and my love is like mist. Everything distracts me. Everything pulls me this direction and that direction. God says, what am I going to do with you? Your love is like the mist, the early dew that just disappears when the sun comes out. Okay, quick, quick aside, listen. God loves Israel. But he knew the gal he had, didn't he? He knew what he had on his hands. And his promise to the nation of Israel, I mean, he, he had promises for blessing if there was obedience. But his ultimate promise for the nation of Israel and his plans for them did not depend on their faithfulness. God knows you and me too. And that's a scary thing, but it's also a good thing. Because when he says, I love you, he's not being deceived by our Sunday polished up selves. He sees us at our worst, and God says, I love you. God knows sometimes our love for him is like the morning mist. God knew the fickle nature of our hearts. When we first came to him in faith and said, Father, forgive me, and he said, come into my family, he already knew all of our future sins, and he said, come on in anyways. And he, he grabbed a hold of us, and he embraced us, and he loves us. He knew how we would disappoint him in the future, and he took us anyways, and God will keep his promise to anyone who trusts him. Okay, look at now chapter 2, uh, 2 through 7. talking about these children of Hosea and Gomer. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife and I'm not her husband. Okay, God is really talking about the nation of Israel, right, in the north. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness between, from between her breasts. You know that adulterous look on somebody's face? I'm going to do whatever I want. You can't judge me. This is my body. I'll do what I want to do. Otherwise, I'm going to strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. In other words, you put your confidence in, in wealth and in money, in, in, in empires, and in, in, in uh, military, but none of that matters on the day you're, you die. And if we put our hope in the things of this world, God's going to reveal it for what it is, and it's nothing. And if we put our confidence there, God says, I'll strip you naked, you'll be like the day you were born, and you will know that none of those things mattered. He said, I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land, and slay her with thirst. There's no spiritual fulfillment in a life lived apart from God. There's emptiness. Our souls become barren and parched. I will not show my love to her children. God's not going to bless our materialism. God's not going to bless our man-made religion. God's not going to bless the things that we do when we're in rebellion to him, and they say, God bless me, God bless me. And God says, I'm not going to bless you when you're running away from me. Because those things are children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful, and she has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after many lovers. How brazen. I will go after many lovers. God, I see you. And there's so many other things else in the world that I'm going to go after and say to you, God, I see you, and I'm going to do my own thing. How brazen, how adulterous, and how it hurts the soul of our loving God. She said, I will go after many lovers because they gave me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. See the confusion there? She thinks that the good things in her life come because she turned away from God and chased after popularity in, in, in fame, in pleasure, in financial riches. All these things she's chasing, and she says, but they give me what I want. And God says, 
You're, not, you're like a whore. It's adultery. Therefore, I'm going to block her path with thorn brushes. I will wall her in so she cannot find her way. And there is no path, there is no way to true life, to spiritual fulfillment, when we chase after all of these many lovers, when we chase after these adulterous things in our life. She will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. It's going to be a futile, empty life. She will look for them, but not find them. Then she will say, listen to this, all right, I'll go back to my husband, just as at first, for at least then I was better off than I am now. What a ringing endorsement for her love for God. Okay, this isn't working out. This is miserable. I've chased after all these things that I thought would bring me life, and there's only hurt and pain and disappointment. Well, okay, I'll go back to church. Fine. Well, okay, I'll, I'll go back to my former ways uh, when she was walking with the Lord. How amazing is the humility of God. Look at how wonderful God is. She turns back to him, not because she's filled up with love for him, not because he's so wonderful and amazing and God's so powerful and the things he does. Look at nature and, and look at all the blessings. No, it's because my life sucks, so I might as well try God. And God is so humble, he says, I can work with that. That's a start. Come back to me and we'll make this work. God is wonderful and he's so humble. She's settling for God. Wow. Talk about being out of touch with reality. She feels like she's settling. <coughs> well, I tried these things and they're not working out for me, so might as well try God. I am in awe of the kindness and humility of the Creator. I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis when he was sharing his salvation story and how he was trying to fight with God and he didn't want to accept God. And he said, when I became a believer, I felt like I was doing God a favor. I was a reluctant convert. And now he says, years later he said, he's in awe of a God that would accept his petulant, self-righteous, self-centered, okay, God, well, I'll give you a try. And God accepted him turning in faith. How amazing, how good God is to us that he, even, even, even when we turn to him out of selfish reasons and even though we're stubborn, it's hard-hearted, we still got so much mess, he doesn't say, clean yourself up and then I'll deal with you. The moment the prodigal son comes, turns back home, the father went running out to embrace him. This is our God. God loves you. And he'll take us as we are, and he'll deal with us with what we've got. Hosea 4.10, this, talking about this empty life, they will eat, but they're never going to have enough. They're going to engage in prostitution, but they're not going to increase. We can get and get and get and get, and life can still seem empty. Hosea 4.5.4, their deeds do not permit them to turn to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. Now, this is interesting. Here's, here's God in heaven speaking through the prophet, and God says that behavior can create a barrier. Behavior can create a reason for us not to find God. See, we can intellectualize it and put all this defense in the air, but at heart, it's because of the things we're doing and we don't want to turn back to God. The ancient prophet is further saying people are missing God because of a spirit of prostitution in their heart. It's selling out, missing God and settling for what is not God. When God says to wipe that adulterous look off your faith, it re face, it reminded me of Proverbs 3.20. Proverbs 3.20 says, The way of an adulterous woman... She eats and wipes her mouth saying, I've done nothing wrong. Do you know that impudent look? I do what I want. I did nothing wrong. You can't judge me. How can you judge me for my life? And it breaks God's heart because he wants to bring us close to him and into his family and meanwhile, we're fighting all these petty fights, fighting all these battles that don't matter. 
The rest of the chapter, though, reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.13, which says, if we are faithless, God remains faithful. Isn't it hard to believe Christianity sometimes? If we are faithless and we're miserable, the perfect one, the holy one, he's going to keep his promise to us. He's gonna, he, we may betray God, but he's not going to betray us. All right, let's look now from chapter 2, 8 through 13. 8 through 13. She has not acknowledged that I am the one. <laughs> I'm the one for you, babe. God says, she has not acknowledged I am the one who gave her the grain and the new wine and the oil. Remember? Remember? She said, I can't leave all these things I'm chasing after. I need to go to work. I can't go to church. I need to do this. I, I'm all about popularity. If I talk about Jesus, what do my friends think? What do my coworkers think? She said, these are the ones that give me what I want in life. And God says, she's not acknowledging that I'm the one who's giving her what she needs in life. She has now acknowledged that I am the one who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, <coughs> now listen to this, which they used for Baal. Imagine this husband giving these beautiful uh, gems, this beautiful necklace and, and, and bracelets and earrings. He's just lavishing a, a wonderful uh, dress on her, and she puts them on so that she can go party with some other guys. God says, I'm blessing you. I blessed your life in so many ways, and all you do is run away from me and chase after things that will not bring you fulfillment. And God says, you're like an adulterer. Therefore, I'll take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her nakedness. Again, this is the emptiness of life lived in rebellion to God. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. Uh, no one will take her out of my hands. I will stop all of her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all of her appointed festivals. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees that she said were her pay from her lovers. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. If our hope is in the physical things of this world, the material things of this world, the empty things of life without God, if our hope is there, they're going to show themselves for what they are, and there's going to be no peace, no fulfillment, no blessing from those. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the Baals, these idols. And she decked herself with rings and jewelry. She decked herself out with all the things God gave, and she went after her lovers, but me she forgot, declares the Lord." How did that even get in Scripture? The vulnerability and the pain that God has here. We, we're used to these declares the Lord. My judgment is coming, declares the war, Lord, right? I gave her all these things, and she decked herself off for her lovers, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. How does God feel when we live for the empty things of the world instead of living for him? Brothers and sisters, let this message impact us. Let it go deep down into our hearts. Let it influence our decisions in the coming year. Me, she forgot. The one who loves us most, the one who, who gave us everything. And his heart feels the pain when we turn away from him and use all of our blessings to chase after empty things. How sad. You know what? If you were God's buddy, right? If you were God's friend and, and you saw him pining away from this gal, with this gal and, and she says, I've done everything for you and you keep chasing after other girls and he blesses her and he's chasing her, he's just emotionally wrecked up. What would you say to God? You'd say, dude, she's not good for you. Let her go. Don't fight for her anymore. Give up on this gal. She's not worth it. She's not worth the effort. I, I often think, what do the perfect holy angels think? They, they serve God without any sin. Now, we have, they have the joy of serving God with, from a sinless heart, right, angels? We have the joy of being forgiven. And I'm forgiven and I'm accept, accepted as I am and I can serve God. But how do angels see us and they see us fighting with God? Who fights with God? Satan, right? And they see us saying, I love you, Jesus, and meanwhile, we're full of lust and greed. And we, we walk out of church, we're raising our hands, and we're singing, we're praying, and we go out and we 
badmouth our husband or our wife or we talk badly about somebody else at church. And the angels are watching all of that. And I wonder if a part of them wonders, why does God love these so much? Why would he become one of them? And I, and I wonder what Satan thinks. He's like, doesn't he see they're not worth it? <laughs> Does it? What is it with God that he would humble himself to these creatures that he manipulates and he, he plays a tune and we dance and he laughs at us and meanwhile he becomes a human being and we spit on him and we beat him and we say, I love you, Jesus, and we ignore him. We don't read our Bibles. We don't pray. We don't go to church. We don't care. And he loves us and we don't care. And the devil thinks, what is wrong with God? Maybe that's why the devil rebelled, because he didn't get God's love. I don't know. I'm, that's a, I'm being hypothetical. From uh, verse 14 now, chapter 2, verse 14. Listen to what God says. She went after her lovers, but me she forgot. Therefore, I'm going to smite her and forget her, and I will never... That's what it says if you have a bad translation of the Bible. If you have an accurate translation of the Bible, it says, therefore, after she's committed adultery, she's ran after all these things, therefore, I'm now going to allure her. He's going to entice her. God of the universe is going to try to win back this fickle, loveless, faithless woman. Why would God chase after people like you and I who don't have the time of day for him? You see now why was he is called this great prophet? The things he say here are amazing. Therefore, I'm going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her. Listen to God, the way he's talking to sinners. I will give her back her vineyards. I will make the door of trouble, a door of acre, a door of hope. He's going to change our trouble into hope. God says, this is my plan for you. I'm going to change your troubles into rejoicing. And God, listen to the yearning in his voice, the way he's pining away. I'm going to lure her. I'm going to lure her into the wilderness. We're going to go into nature. I'm going to speak tenderly. I'm going to give her all these gifts. I'm going to bring for her troubles. I'm going to replace them with hope. And then there she will respond as in the days of her youth, in the day when she came out of Egypt. And in in, in Greek, in the, in the New Living uh, in translation, it says, there she will give herself to me. Or maybe your translation says, there she will sing. And this also is shocking to me, and it shows me a little, God doesn't see things right. God has seen us through grace-colored lenses. When I remember the people of Egypt, the Jews coming out of Egypt, I remember they complained a lot. I remember they were rebellious. And God is looking back to that time. He's remembering the way they danced, the way they celebrated, the way they sang when they came out of Egypt. God is selectively choosing how to view his people. And when God sees you and I, he's soon has seen us through the lenses, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't see all of our messed up filth. He doesn't see all the hatred and the bitterness the things we struggle with. He sees us in the beauty of Christ. This is a God who chooses to see us as better than we are. And he's going to call us and make us better than we could ever be on our own. In that day, this is God's someday. Remember when we were studying the Old Testament? We all said God's someday. God, looking forward to the day, I love these people. And someday they're going to love me too. See the heart of God? Someday the churches of of Janesville are going to love me the way I love them. Someday the, the, the Christians in America are going to love me the way I love them. And God says, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. Look at how we sang that song, I'm going to enter in as the wedding bells ring. When we enter into heaven, the wedding bells are going to be ringing because the church is the bride of Christ. And look at how this looks forward to the New Testament. God says, someday you're going to call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of your lovers from the bales from your lips. No longer will their names be invoked. God's looking forward to the day when we don't chase after all the garbage and the emptiness. Hallelujah. Amen. In that day, 
I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the sky, the creatures that move along the ground, before everything, bow and sword and battle, I will abolish them from the land. There's going to be no more war, no more strife, no, no pitiful deaths. So that all may lie down safely. This is God's view of the future. I will betroth you to me forever. He says, we're going to have a marriage celebration. We're going to make this right. I will betroth you in righteousness and in justice, in love and in compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness. And you will acknowledge the Lord in that day. I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel, and I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one called not my loved one. I will say to those who were called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. And God is yearning. Well, this is about the people, this is the nation of Israel, right? But it shows God's heart towards his people. He's yearning for the time when we say, you are my God. You are my God, and I love you, and I want to be with you forever. Brothers and sisters, God sees us in our sin, and yet he tries to woo us to him with his love. I want to ask you a question. Everybody pay attention. How does it feel to be the object of God's pursuit? You are are a special prize to God. God wants to pursue you and chase you. <coughs> Listen to the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you aren't sure if you're truly saved, why not today? Why not get right with the Lord? And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope you find rest and comfort in this message. And also, each one of us are going to resolve to treat other believers and people who don't yet know Christ with the same kind of undeserved love that we've been given. Grace is getting goodness you don't deserve. John Christosom, who was the Archbishop of Constantinople around the year 400 AD, pointed out that unfaithful people are like a harlot who rejected the bridegroom, Christ. While the church is like the harlot who embraced Christ. Let's look at chapter 3. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Imagine how he would have felt to hear those words. God says, you know, probably a small village. She's living with another man, or maybe she's in the brothel. Everybody's going to see the prophet walk through town going to get my wife. Grab a hold of her and bring her out of there. This is what God did for us. He says, go show your love to your wife again, although she is loved by another and she is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. I don't know. You know, apparently that was part of worship of Baal, right? I mean, from the context. But didn't that come a little unexpected? Like, you know, imagine the gossip. Hey, did you see what Wilbur was doing? He was loving sacred raisin cakes. <laughs> he just eats those sacred raisin cakes up all every chance he gets. I was wondering where the sacred raisin cakes went, you know. Uh, I don't know. It seemed so out of place. Uh, the, the, though, though she turned to other gods and she ate these raisin cakes. But anyways, God put it in there. So it's good. Uh, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and I bought a homer and a lethic of barley. So he goes in, he buys his own wife back. Is that fair? When love is part of the equation, fairness is not part of the equation. Is it fair that God of the universe had to bleed and die to purchase you and I? 
that the blood of Jesus Christ redeemed us from our sins. God is showing us this is how he loves. He goes, it's not fair, there's shame, and he grabs his wife and he pays for her, and she ain't worth it. Gomer ain't worth some barley. She ain't worth the price he paid. But God, in God's eyes, she is worth it because God has these weird eyes. God thinks Gomer is worth it. So the prophet says, I did what God said. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man. You know, that's not legalism, people. <laughs> We're always saying, oh, God wants me to love him, read my Bible, pray, go to church, all these things. But I want to chase after all these other things. And it's legalism if I have to love. No, it's not. He says, you're going to come with me. And you're not going to go chase those other things anymore. And that is reasonable. You are to live with me many days, and you must not be a prostitute or intimate with any other man, and I will behave the same way towards you. And it's possible that this is showing God saving the nation of Israel, but there's this time, there's this waiting period. This is possible interpretation where they belong to him, but they're not yet his people because they haven't consummated the relationship. And that could be what we're looking at with a nation of Israel that's not fully committed to Jesus Christ and the Lord yet. So that's one interpretation of that. Uh, if so, it's an incredible prophecy. In fact, uh, there's this scholar, and I forget his name, but he's a, a Christian, but he's a Jew. He's a Jewish believer. He's a Messianic Jew. And he calls this prophecy here in verses 4 and 5 the greatest prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, listen to this. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince. So there's this time of they're brought back together, they're redeemed, but they're not yet following the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Uh, for the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods, which is the case today. You have the Jewish people, but there's no temple. There's no, there's no uh, a way to worship God. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. In some translations, it actually says they're going to seek the Messiah here because it's talking about the descendants of David, the descendant of David, and they will come trembling to the Lord like a bride on her honeymoon. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So we're now looking forward to the end of time when the people of Israel come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah the descendant of David. This is a powerful and beautiful message. J. Vernon McGee said, Do you know that you and I have been redeemed? We've been bought out. The picture here is not very pretty, McGee says. That is the reason it's not being preached more today. We hear a great deal in conservative circles about dedication, about commitment, about turning your life over to the Lord. But my friend, the first thing you need to do is come to God as a sinner, he has to redeem you. Just as Hosea bought this harlot, that is the way God redeemed us. <clears throat> Until you see that, we can know nothing of real commitment to God. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. Gomer wasn't worth it, and we are not worth the redemption price that was paid for us. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1. He had to shed his blood. He had to suffer and die that you and I might be redeemed. Why? Because we were lost sinners sold under sin. I said a few weeks ago, you're never going to understand Christmas unless we understand our own sin. And we're going to never understand how much Christ gave to us, how he walked into that brothel and said, come with me, you're mine, and I paid for you with my own blood, unless we understand our own sin and rebellion to God, unless we understand how wretched we are, how messed up we are, how broken we are, how selfish we are, how quickly we turn to all these other things and turn away from God. We're never going to love Jesus the way we should unless we understand our brokenness. You see how that works? Help us all. In this room, this is a room where I see mighty men and women of God. This is a beautiful sight. I get to see a beautiful sight every Sunday. I love it. I get up here and I often smile at you guys. That's why I love seeing what I'm seeing. We can turn our lives to Jesus and he can use our lives for wonderful and powerful things. 
Please remember our brokenness. There's no pride in brokenness, just tenderness and compassion. If you enjoy the Lord and celebrate his love, you can have more patience for other people, right? If I'm enjoying Christ, I'm so thankful for the price he paid for me. I'm going to be more patient when other people <coughs> just as messed up as me. <coughs> as a church, brothers and sisters, I don't want us to be quick to write people off, saying, okay, they're missing out, heck with them. <laughs> they don't seem to care about Jesus. We're not going to care about them. They're so angry all the time. They're so selfish all the time. They're so whatever. I'm a sinner that have, have, have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I want to love other people because Christ loved me. Fight for people. Don't give up on people. Love people. Have grace for those around us. Don't tire of forgiving them again and again and again because Jesus forgives me again and again and again. And if we do these things, we're going to be more like Christ who pursued his beloved to hell and back again. I don't know what all those verses mean. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and descended to hell, I don't know what all that means, but I know he'll chase down He'll chase people as far as it goes. And then Jesus says, come follow me. We're going to rescue some more people. Come follow me. And we say, yeah, but I'm busy with my other lovers. And Jesus says, come follow me. And we'll say, okay, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. And then we say, wait, where is he going? That looks like a cross. It looks like it's going to hurt to love people. It looks like sacrifice is painful. And Jesus says, come follow me. We're in something, and this is going to be worth it. And we're going to gather a whole big family together, and we're going to grab them right out of hell, right out of the brothel, and we're going to bring them into our family, and we're going to love one another. And he says, and I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, and you're no longer going to have on your lips the names of all your lover, other lovers. It's in the past. You've forgotten them, and now your heart has turned to me. God pursues. God's love is fierce. And again, this is the weirdest thing. God is unashamed to call us his. He says, that one's mine. That girl, she's mine. And sometimes we're embarrassed <laughs> to talk about our faith in other people. And he's not embarrassed to say, this one's mine. This one belongs to me. The book of Hosea shows us that when we are at our worst, in rebellion to God, full of self-righteousness, full of ego and, and bitterness, and, and filled with greed and lust and anger, God still wants you. When we're at our worst, sitting in the home of our lover, because we've turned our back on God, he will go after us. He still wants us. God wants us at our worst. God wants us enough to pursue us into a brothel, grab our hand, and bring us back home where we should have been all along. God is in the saving business. That's what he does. That's what he does. He wants to save us from our sins. He wants to save us from death, to save us to paradise with him. Hosea 13, 14 says, I will deliver them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? And we know this first from the New Testament because the New Testament authors were echoing back to Hosea. And it's beautiful. I wonder if the whole idea of calling the church the bride of the Christ came right out of the book of Hosea. This is a powerful book. And the book ends with these ancient, ancient words. Again, 100 years before Buddha or, 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 or Confucius, when Rome was just a new little town. Listen to these ancient, beautiful words from chapter 14, verses 1 and 2 and then 9. Return Israel to the Lord your God. Listen to the heart of God. Return to me. Your sins have been your downfall. Return to the Lord and repent. Make a U-turn. Say to him, and listen to this. Here's a New Testament prayer of forgiveness in the Old Testament. Repent of your sins, turn to the Lord, and then say to God, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. We worship a God who is yearning 
for the happy end. God, someday, when we respond to his love with love of our own, here's what that's going to look like. Here's what the happy, happy end looks like. Hosea goes and gets Gomer, and she falls in love with him. Sounds kind of unrealistic, doesn't it? Sounds unrealistic. And you know, sometimes we look around and say, boy, that person will never be a Christian. We've got people in our church who people thought, well, that person that would never be a Christian. Here they are, loving God. God goes, in, Hosea goes and gets Gomer, and she falls in love with him. I don't care if it's unrealistic. God's love trumps. But it happens again and again. God goes and gets people out of this world that the world would say, oh, that person will never be a Christian. He loves them. And guess what? They learn to fall in love with him too. That's what we're doing at church. We're falling in love with Jesus. We're learning to fall in love with God. Hosea gets Gomer and she smiles again. And she laughs. And she sings love songs to him. That's what we do with worship service. She dances. The pain is gone from her face. Remembered no more. The scars are washed away. And the Bible tells us our sins are washed white by the blood of Jesus Christ. She enjoys to be with her husband. Her former lovers are in the past. She will not go back to them. She doesn't secretly yearn for them. As Song of Solomon 7.10 says, I am, in my, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Have you ever said those words and believed it? I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Crazy. You are the prize of God's pursuit. Don't you feel like, boy, I'm not such a good prize sometimes? That's because we don't see things the way God does. God says, you are the prize of my... Remember, Christ, Isaiah tells us, after Christ has died on the cross, this is Old Testament, he's going to see the light of life again. He's going to grab all of his plunder. He's going to see the reward of his suffering. We are the reward of his suffering. We are the prize of Christ's love. And she, Jenny, Gomer, is so confident in the love of her husband that she becomes radiant and more beautiful than ever. And this is what God is yearning for. And listen to what it says in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, listen, to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, the Bible, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, you thought I was making up all that stuff, right? No, God says, my church is so beaten and scarred and the world is so hard. I'm going to make her beautiful and she's going to be radiant without stain or wrinkle, no blemish at all. And she won't call it legalism to spend time with him, I'll tell you that. To share all that she has with her beloved won't seem like an empty ritual. Legalism is what's left when we go through the actions of obeying God but have no love for him in our hearts. That's not us, people. We don't want that to be us. Here's my closing thought, and it's a challenge for us. God is waiting for us to respond to him. How would that look in 2016 for us as a church and as individuals if we were to fall deeper in love with the God who pursues us, who sees us as a prize worth winning, a prize worth suffering for? Two things. What would it mean for me to ignore God in this? And what would it look like for me to yield more fully to him? Let's pray, and then I'm going to ask uh, Dad and Rachel to come up here and share with us this song that my uncle wrote to illustrate this amazing, scandalous, and wonderful love that God has for us. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and talk with God. Let's pray. Dear love, here we, here we are. God, thank you for loving us when we're unlovely. Thank you for seeing us when we're at our worst and still pursuing us. Thank you for paying such a high price for us. Sometimes we feel worthless you thought we were worth shedding your blood for, God. Lord God, I ask that every one of us in this room would surrender ourselves to you more completely.
Help us to have faith in you. Help us to trust you. Help us no longer to run away from you, Lord. We want to follow you all the days of our lives. We want to be your people. We don't want to chase after these false, empty things anymore, God. Lord, we resolve today that we want to be a part of your family. Lord, please bless us. Use our church for your glory. Please bless our families and use them. They're yours. And Father, here we are as individuals, and we say, Lord, we belong to you. We belong to you, Lord. Teach us your ways. Help us to respond to your love, Lord, with love that you've stirred up deep within our souls. Thank you, God, for each person here. Thank you for the service, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.
you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.